fungi, a new vision. Now we learn these complex life cycles and the complex life cycles of the rhodophyta, which are really pretty amazing when you think about it. There's extra sporophytes that are in there. The fungi take it to a whole new level. They are completely different, weird organisms. If there's any organisms that have a claim to have come from outer space, you know, there's an extraterrestrial theory of the origin of life. If there's any organisms that might have come from outer space, it is the fungi because they are so completely different than anything else we've seen. And the level of complexity of the life cycles, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till we get to the parasitic fungi in the Basidio mycota, which we'll do just a couple weeks from now, just before um, the midterm. Those will be the most complex life cycles that we do the whole semester. And it gets really, the life cycles after that get very easy. But they're going to get a little more difficult now in the next few lectures as we go through the fungi. So we've been talking about the difference between the classifications of the uh, that different biologists have. And we know that the level of the classification that a biologist puts these organisms in can vary. So you look in one textbook, and these organisms might be called the Acrasiomycetes. In another or textbook, they might be called the Acrasiomycota. This is one of the groups we're going to work with, the cellular slime molds, the organisms that Dr. Steinley works with. This ending, Mycetes, is the class ending for these organisms. And the ending, Mycota, is the division ending. So we see in those two cases these two different, seemingly different classifications are really about exactly the same organisms. It's just that one author has put these organisms at the class level, and one, organi or one author has put them at the division level. Just change the place in the division, in the hierarchy where they place them. So that's the case of all of these classifications, all the way down this left side. They are all at the class level. All of the ones that we're going to be doing in this course are on the right side, and you see they all end in mycota, which is at the division level. And that's how your textbook treats them. It treats them at the division level, and I think it's a better classification. So it, I think it represents more correctly the relationship between these organisms. Although there is something to be said over here on the left side for this class, and here we have mycotina. This is the subdivision level. So by putting these organisms at the class level, by putting the Basidiomycetes, the Ascomycetes, et cetera, all at class level, we've got this other division, the subdivision level, that we can use. And now we can make subdivisions that separate our classes into these two groups. And these two groups are actually pretty well, uh, they're, very, they're very well di differentiated from each other, and they're probably not really, really closely related to each other. I'll show you the phylogeny in just a second. And these then are what this author is calling the lower fungi and the true fungi. Or we might call these guys here the plasmodial. And all of these guys down here, the filamentous or the height, the, the filaments are called hyphae now. I will explain that term in a second. The hyphal fungi. The filamentous fungi, the plasmodial fungi, and the filamentous or hyphal fungi are our two big groups. And we see that on the left represented at the subdivision level, the eumycotina and the myxomycotina. 
But as I say, we're not going to follow that classification. We're going to use the one on the right at the division level. We're going to call these groups the acrasiomycota, the basidiomycota, the myxomycota, acrasiomycota, myxomycota. Those are plasmodial ones. They, not, they do not have filamentous life bodies. And then the zygomycota, the ascomycota, and the basidiomycota. And those are the ones that are more filamentous and or hyphal. And we'll look at that in one second. We're going to start with the zygomycota in a minute after a little more introduction. And we're going to go down and do ascomycota and basidiomycota. And then we're going to come back and talk about acrasiomycota and myxomycota just before midterm. Remember the protista. These organisms are priced in the protista. These plasmodial fungi are priced in the protista by your textbook. And we are not putting them there. We are going to put them in the division fungi for reasons I'm about to show you with the phylogeny in a second. Here are some of the organisms. This is a shell fungus. In the basidiomycota, but that doesn't matter for us right now. So this is the fruiting body. And here is the main vegetative body. It doesn't look like much. We'll show you some close-ups of that. And that's that little white fuzz down there. You can barely see it, just that kind of little white fuzz. This is called the mycelium. The root myke means fungus. M-Y-C means fungus. So this is the body of the fungus, the vegetative body of the fungus. Not the fruiting part, but the vegetative part that is just growing and assimilating nutrients. Here's what it looks like more closely. So each of these filaments now has a special name. Of course, it has a special name. We're in a different kingdom. These are called hyphae or hypha is singular, A-E is plural, hypha would be one, but there's never just one, hyphae, plural. And the whole body of the fungus is called the mycelium. So all of those hyphae taken together is the mycelium. You can see the same thing now over here. Here are the mycelia of other fungi. These are wood rot fungi. Well, I hope when we go outside to look at these, we'll have a good day. In a couple, two weeks, I think we go outside and walk around campus and look for fungi and lichens outside. And I hope we can open up some logs and see these things growing there. So they've got these masses of mycelia. Now, those ropey things are not just a single filament. They're whole bunches of filaments that are growing together. And then all smaller filaments, you can see down here, all this white, powdery-like looking things. That, if we took and enlarged that, we would see this. So these are the mycelial fungi. That's a very characteristic of one group of, these, of the fungi. Within the mycelial fungi, we have two different types. We have one type that's above our red line, which is, now I'm going to use terms from the algae, because they are really descriptive and they help us. We know the terms. These are not typical terms you're going to encounter in the fungi. But we can use them. We're, all, we're going to use them because they're so descriptive. And that is, it's siphonous and cenocytic. So there are no internal cell walls, and it's multinuclear, siphonous and cenocytic. The other fungi below the line are septate. Septate, you remember, means fence. And so they have cell walls, or septate. So that would be AE. Septi, 
plural cell walls between the cells. So it's divided up into cells. Now it's divided up in some funny ways. We'll talk about that a little bit now and talk about that more as we get into the different divisions. First thing, these, these cell walls sometimes have holes in them. Like in the red algae, we sometimes have holes and we're gonna get really strange things happening through those holes. The second thing is that instead of having a single nucleus, we have often, for at least part of this life cycle, two nuclei. So I'm gonna write two haploid nuclei per cell, but you realize, I want you to realize it's not in the whole life cycle of the organism, but only in parts of the life cycle. We'll define what parts as we go on. But it's so unusual It's so unusual that we have a new term for it. Of course we have a new term for it. In fact, several new terms. So we know that the term for nucleus is carrion in Greek. And we know that there are two of them, two nuclei. So it's di karyotic. So these cells are dikaryotic if there are two haploid nuclei. When there are two nuclei like that, they are always haploid. Now notice I've also drawn those nuclei in different colors. That's an indication that they come from different sources. So they're gonna originate from the process of plasmogamy. And we'll talk about plasmogamy more in a minute. But plasmogamy is the fusion of the cytoplasms. You know those roots already. Plasm, something molded or formed, gammy, marriage. So marriage of the plasms, of the cytoplasms in this case. So the, the dikaryotic cells originate through plasmogamy, but that plasm, plasmogamy is not directly followed by karyogamy. not directly followed by karyogamy. So that gives us our dikaryotic cells, and those dikaryotic cells are also then heterokaryotic. Hetero different. So heterokaryotic is an indication that they have arisen from plasmogamy. They've come from two different strains, one cell, one nucleus from each strain. So you see, we've got a really weird situation already. We have an organism that, when it undergoes syngamy, doesn't undergo syngamy. Syngamy is now divided into two separate stages. It's divided into plasmogamy and karyogamy. And we'll repeat all of this later. So I'm just giving you a taste now. So. Syngamy is not a single process anymore. It's divided into plasmogamy and karyogamy, two different stages. And they're separated by relatively long periods of time. In fact, in the Basidiomycota, which we'll do next week, we'll start next week, most of the life cycle of the organism is spent in this dikaryotic stage. So it's got a way of growing and maintaining a dikaryotic condition. Where do these guys occur in the phylogeny? <coughs> well, we have, in this diagram labeled the fungi, this is the, these are the uh, cellular, or the hyph hyph hyphal fungi, mycelial fungi. You notice they're up there related to animals. They're not very closely related to the rest of the plants. Now, traditionally, they were placed in the plant kingdom. And if you actually go and you look at the 
logo for the American, um, the Botanical Society of America, it's got a fungus on it and the Mycological Society always meets with the Botanical Society of America. So there's this traditional association between botany and fungi. But new molecular work has placed them over near the animals. And so really, when you're taking vertebrates, you should also be taking a course that includes the fungi because they belong phylogenetically over there. But for historical reasons, we've got them in this class. Lucky you. No, really lucky you. They're really cool organisms. The slime molds, these guys are the plasmodial fungi. And we are calling this group the fungi, the kingdom fungi. That's my phone going off. Reminding me that I'm supposed to do something that I've already done. Usually, usually it's having a little time out for a dance. <laughs> Won't do that in class. The kingdom fungi. So that's our kingdom fungi. You notice something about that group. That group is not monophyletic. That's because if we were to make a cut on the our tree, we were to cut it at one place, we would lift off a group that included the animals. So any group that includes both the mycelial and the plasmodial fungi and is a monophyletic group has to include the animals. That's why I say you should be doing vertebrate with the fungi. That's where they belong. The group that we're doing, we have to get two cuts. We have to cut to get the monophyletic group I've just described, and then we have to cut again here to remove the animals. And that gives us our non-monophyletic kingdom fungi. So in modern terms, we don't think of the kingdom fungi as being a, a, a um, natural group. It's not a coherent evolutionary unit but we're going to use it anyway for traditional kind of reasons. It's always been a traditional kingdom, and we're going to maintain that. In fact, no one has, has suggested that we make a new kingdom that is including the animals, fungi, and the plasmodial slime molds. There have been suggestions that the mycelial fungi and the plasmodial fungi be separated off maybe into their own kingdoms, but it gets too weird. Then, because then you're just going to start to say everything's going to be a kingdom. There's only two, there's only a couple organisms in the plasmodial fungi, the plasmodial slime molds. There's not very many organisms there. And so you get to the place where you're starting to have so many kingdoms described that it becomes unwieldy. Having a hierarchy which, with fewer groups at the top, that, that purpose is defeated. So we don't have a good solution to this. Evolution does not follow our schemes. In general now, we're talking about this group, the fungi that I've just talked about. This is, the, when I say fungi now, I mean the mycelial and plasmodial fungi. So there are non-modal spores in here. So we have no flagella. We're not gonna find flagella any place in, in these groups. We can't call those asexual spores zoospores anymore because they are not zoospores, they're not mobile. So we can call them mitospores or sometimes aplanospores. Plano is wandering. A is not. So a planospore is non-mobile spores, non-wandering spores, non-mobile spores. No flagella. 
if these uh, spores originated from sexual reproduction, from meiosis, of course, we call them myospores. Most of the organisms have sexual and asexual reproduction. And asexual, there's different kinds of asexual reproduction. Fragmentation is very important in these organisms. But in many of them, even more than fragmentation, there are uh, abundant production of asexual mitospores or aplanospores. And in fact, this air that we're breathing is full. You would be astounded at how many fungal spores there are in this air. I have sometimes brought in, and one of my ex-students who took this class many years ago, he broke off and did a number of things and ended up starting his own company with a colleague, and they do indoor air testing. And he brings in his filters, and he will filter the air for the class for a couple minutes, and you just get a slide that's just covered with these spores. They're all over the air. So you see them when the sunlight comes in through the window, and you can sometimes see all the dust in the air. A lot of that is our fungal spores. They are so abundant. They are produced so abundantly from these fungi that they're every place. So asexual reproduction by spores and fragmentation, very important. But now in certain groups only, we see another kind of reproduction, which is called fission or budding, a kind of cell division. These really only occur in unisexual organisms, uh, not unisexual, unicellular organisms. So in certain groups which have unicellular, we get a special kind of cell division called fission or budding. And mainly this is in the yeast. So when we talk about the yeast, maybe even today, we could talk, we'll talk a little bit about budding. 